good morning good morning sir uh, so thank you for the opportunity to present our work i shall be discussing on the microbial milieu of the post mortem conjunctival sac so the human cornea is retrieved from the donor eyes after death and before collecting we typically put povidon iodine so that it disinfects the cornea but the protocols for povidon iodine are very different so we don't know that some organisms survive how much contact time every eye bank has their own sop and also we notice that since the almost the last 15 to 20 years there is no study which enumerates how the conjunctival microbes grow after death nobody knows there is one study in igo long back in 78 like that from then there is no idea about how the demographics change and how the microorganisms differ so with this background we thought that let us take swabs and understand what are the growth patterns and how it changes after death that is also important so after covid as we know that the eye bank association of india changed the rules of eye eye collection from up to 12 hours 6 to 8 hours was normal in india so now it changed to up to 24 hours if the body has been refrigerated so we divided so with this background we divided our study into two study parts so as we know that uh, the cause of infection in the recipient is twofold one is external meaning that the skin around the periocular tissue may get contaminated second is when there is a decomposition of the body so the gut microbe start moving across the whole body so there is a external source there is an internal source of infection and the incidence of infection is 0.2 to 0.7 endophthalmitis after transplant and 6.5 to 10.5% after uh, microbial keratitis after transplant so this contamination as i discussed is both internal and external external from the skin staphylococcus around the periocular skin internal is from the gut bacteria so what we also found in in some of the recent papers that we reviewed was that the tissue that is coming to the cornea surgeon is stored in tissue storage medium it has antibiotics mk medium cornisol but there is no antifungals but in a hot humid climate it is not uncommon that fungi also grow in these conjunctival cul de sacs so should we also supplement with antifungals so that is again another live question that we are dealing with scientifically so with this background the purpose was to study the microbial milieu of the post mortem conjunctival cul de sac within and beyond 12 hours of death so suitable donors from the bodies we took swabs and we plated them in the culture plates within 12 hours and beyond 12 hours and then from the colony morphology we try to understand whether they are bacteria fungi what type of bacteria from the gram smear we can make out spore forming bacteria hyaline fungus likewise we included all suitable donors between 18 to 80 years of age and either gender and up to 24 hours of death and we excluded the common excluded contraindications for eye donation so drowning ventilator septicemia and likewise so our baseline demographics in those bodies from where the swabs were taken within 12 hours and those where it was taken beyond 12 hours was similar so there were 52 eyes of 26 donors in within 12 hour group 50 eyes of 24 donors in beyond 12 hours group the mean age the male age to female ratio was matched the mean death to preservation time in the early collection group was 7.5 hours and 15 and half hours in those where it was beyond uh, 12 hours and these were the bacteria that we grow and the fungi so within 12 hours we found that there was more hyaline fungus and candida and the candida ratio was much more in those where the swabs were collected beyond 12 hours meaning that the odds of a candida culture was more if the body was preserved beyond 12 hours this is important because then we have to think of preserving this cornea storage media with some antifungal supplementation these are very preliminary studies but this was the main conclusion of our study
So thank you very much for the opportunity. <coughs> Very useful presentation, Arvindra. Thank you. The presentation of a senior most. Then <laughs> <laughs> within time. Next up is next presenter, Dr. Divya Bhargavi. Is there? Good morning, sir. Uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. And today my free paper is about ectopia lentis, what, when, and how. This is to show that uh, the types of management of ectopia lentis, which we came across in, your, in our hospital. And today's agenda would be introduction to the topic, physical traits of the uh, patients, overview of the cases with management strategies, <laughs> visual outcomes, and conclusion. And for the introduction, ectopia lentis refers to the hereditary or acquired malposition of the natural crystalline lens out of the patellar fossa. It could be traumatic or hereditary secondary to underlying systemic diseases. It can be autosomal dominant or recessive inheritance patterns. And for the management of uh, ectopia lentis, the current practices we manage, uh, we have are pars planar vitrectomy with lensectomy, Cataract extraction with anterior vitrectomy, anterior chamber eye veil, iris claw or iris sutured eye veil, scleral fixated eye veils, uh, PC eye veil with CTRs and CT, uh, capsular tension segments, and also the use of femtosecond laser for subluxated lens management. Uh, so in our hospital, we conducted a retrospective observational study of children with subluxated lens in the outpatient department. All the data related to history, uh, axial length, K values and all are taken from the uh, DMR section of the hospital. And the baseline characteristics were studied. And uh, to take a detour, ectopia lentis is also seen in uh, children with short stature and also tall stature. In uh, short stature, we have Will Machasani syndrome, a 30-year-old female who came for uh, blurring of vision at the age uh, where we do not expect, but she came with the cataractus changes in her in inferior subluxated lens. And also a eight year old child with the similar stature, short stubby fingers and short stature. But this child came with complaints of difficulty while reading and writing in the school and with a headache uh, while reading. And on dilatation, the, the child showed uh, nasally subluxated lens in both the eyes with persistent pupillary membrane. And for the management part, the 30-year-old lady, we went ahead with iris claw lens with uh, peripheral iridotomy. And for the child, uh, his best corrected visual acuity was 618 with minus 10 diopters in both the eyes. And intraocular pressure was 25 and 34 millimeters of mercury. So uh, NDR peripheral iridotomy was advised. Uh, but the patient did not fall, come for follow-up. And now to come to the presentation of tall patient, tall children with subluxated lens. Most of the patients had similar features like superior temporal subluxated lens, strabismus, some presented with shallow orbits, and all of them had arm span more than 1.04. So this is a case where uh, we saw inferior subluxated lens and with a pedigree of this kind. 
the child had a uh, sibling with similar features and also cousins and a paternal aunt with similar features who underwent surgery for all uh, in all the family and all of them had arm span ratio of more than 1.04 and coming to the overview of the co cases how we managed there are total of eight cases where one two cases underwent iris claw lens with peripheral iridotomy and uh, to present uh, a family of this pedigree which I have mentioned before. The girl was 13 year old. Uh, she had infronasal subluxated lens and she underwent surgery. The vision improved to 612. And the seven year old uh, sibling of this girl had a superotemporal subluxated lens for which we prescribed glasses. Considering his age, uh, the surgery was not advised. And there is another eight year old boy who is um, who had tall parents, but without any features other than the tall, tallness, but had arm span ratio of more than 1.04, flat case, supratemporal, subluxated. And he had cataractous changes in his lens, so we un we, he underwent posterior chamber eye oil with uh, capsular uh, tension ring, and the size of the bag was not sufficient, so the both the haptics were trimmed and inserted into the eye oil, and he achieved a vision of 624. A six-year-old uh, male again, but now this time he had a steep cornea and superior subluxated lens who underwent PCI oil. Uh, since the bag has not dislocated, there is no gross dislocation. Only uh, with eight mm pupil, the bag was still in the uh, pupillary axis. And there is another family where 10-year-old uh, and six-year-old children came to the hospital with a grandfather who had plus, who was wearing plus 10 glasses because of which uh, we understood that he m might be of some uh, syndromic approach. And both were prescribed glasses. And for comparison of visual outcomes, all of them showed uh, an average of four uh, lines of visual acuity improvement after surgery rather than with glasses. And to conclude, children were in the age group of 6 to 15 years. There is no sex predilection. Corneal curvatures can be flat or steep in all these cases. There is no pattern for subluxation as we have uh, learned. And the surgical correction always gave a better visual outcome than the glasses alone. So, so to summarize, ectopia lentis has varied presentations with etiologies listed. And the management strategies cannot be designed and must be customized according to the vision and need of the patient. Uh, thank you. Trimming of lens. Uh, both the haptics were uh, cut with uh, a. Uh, what what lens? Is, what type of lens? Single piece lens? Or, uh, uh, that's a three piece lens, sir. Uh, we. Um, uh, after lens is insert a portable lens. I mean, it can, it can be accommodated in any. But the size of the bag was less than the uh, actual size of the optic uh, haptic. Optic What's haptic the size lens? of the bag? Size of the bag was 10 mm when we uh, measured after. First, we tried to insert the eye oil, but it was not fitting inside. So we tried to measure it the wide to wide length, but it came up to uh, be 10 uh, mm. Uh, so we trimmed the eye oil. The bag is 10 mm, uh, even 8 mm, uh, what way, in three piece lens can be inserted. But we already inserted the CTR. So the haptic was coming into the pupillary axis even after folding. So it could be. <laughs> So we went ahead. Thanks. Next speaker is Dr. Bhavik Pancha. Dr. Harsha Khand. <laughs> Check. Yeah, good morning everybody. And uh, today my presentation is on 
different types of uh, corneal foreign bodies post injury and its correlation with specific operation as you all know corneal uh, corneal foreign bodies are the most common ophthalmological emergency cases this type of injury often occurs at work domestic leisure uh, activity like home gardening playing sports or on a windy day ocular trauma is the leading cause of unilateral loss of vision and visual impairment uh, corneal foreign bodies are small particles that impinge upon the cornea causing ocular symptoms including red eye foreign body sensation irritation tearing pain blurred vision removal of this uh, corneal foreign body is necessary and they make uh, they may cause corneal opacities rustering and secondary infection like bacterial keratitis to end of thalmitis corneal foreign body are the common occupational hazard and cause ocular morbidity and loss of time of work despite the use of safety precautions our aim of the study what what are the different types of corneal foreign bodies post injury and its correlation with spe specific occupation as you know it is a hospital based uh, prospective observational study which was conducted in ophthalmological department at tertiary care center uh, the study duration was from 20 january 2022 to december 2022 90 patients was a sample size and uh, the subject selection method was uh, who fulfilled the inclusion and exclusion criteria inclusion criteria included participated uh, voluntarily in the study age between 10 to 60 years diagnosed or had suspected diagnosis of corneal foreign body were able to complete uh, complete the anterior segment examination with clear anterior segment uh, color photography had lesion with uh, depth that, that did not exceed 2/3 of the corneal thickness exclusion criteria included uh, age less than 10 years or more than 60 years full thickness penetrating uh, corneal injury with corneal foreign bodies injury with signs of corneal infection <coughs> after uh, tenant of declaration helinski and approved by the institutional review board and ethics committee a verbal consent and, uh, was obtained from the patient before completing the questionnaire we asked about the dermographic information name age gender education occupation activity at the time of injury at work during laser domestic activities the eye wash was done or medication was used after the injury time between the injury and the patient visit to the ophthalmology department any previous similar eye injuries lt of the protective eyewear at work whether eyewear were used during the injury uh, we uh, did the slit lamp by microscopy examination uh, by putting topical anesthesia entire segment photography was taken focusing mostly on the cornea and the depth of corneal foreign body corneal foreign body was marked uh, as central paracentral peripheral taking into account the 3 mm radius from the center 3 to 6 cm radius from the paracentral as paracentral and beyond that uh, was Uh, peripheral is noted in figure 1 you can see there a b and c <coughs> fluorescent stain was used if required to delineate foreign body and residual abrasion corneal foreign body was removed with 26 hours needle or tubercular syringe and topical anesthesia topical antibody along with tear substitute were prescribed for the treatment we did the statistical and the ssp version 24 was used and from the result we could uh, find that the mean age was 36.7 years it was more male preponderance and the uh, uh, majority of the patient were between 31 to 40 years like 42.2% uh, 42.2% percent patient were between 31 to 40 years right side uh, of the eye was more affected than the left eye and uh, when we uh, check the various types of corneal foreign body found in the eye we found that metallic foreign body was highest around 53.33% followed by dust and wood thorn these are some of different types of corneal foreign, foreign bodies metallic foreign bodies dust particle wood thorn corneal foreign bodies glass foreign bodies insect exoskeleton you can make out plastic foreign body gunpowder and glue uh, glue fevi quick injury when we compile the various types of corn, uh, corneal foreign body found in the eye uh, metallic followed by dust it a metallic was the highest Uh, distribution of corneal foreign body as per the occupation we found that industrial and construction worker had highest like industrial had the highest around 54.4% patient had the highest uh, like uh, as per the occupation followed by construction and agriculture work and uh, the mean time of presentation we can make out that the mean time was 2.15 days but the industrial and construction wor worker came in less than 1 and 1/2 days as you can see 1.38 to 1.35 days and domestic worker came after 3 days the majority of the location of the corneal foreign body was 
in the para central area followed by central and peripheral and uh, we and the question when we found that the preventable use of uh, a protective eyewear could prevent around 65.5% patients if they have used it so as uh, discussion corneal foreign bodies are the commonly seen ocular injury in day to day life the industrial worker get injured by metallic foreign body due to the use of high speed grinding drilling machine at workplace many construction worker are exposed to sand metal dust cement paint particles as their working place at their working place farmers are exposed to various foreign body like dust or vegetative matter most of their injuries are superficial usually without visual disability so they don't affect the patient's quality of life it was observed that most of these corneal foreign body injuries could have been prevented if proper precaution and preventive eyewear were used to conclude the most common type of corneal foreign body found in the study was metallic uh, foreign bodies most of these corneal foreign bodies were found in the paracentral area of the cornea industrial construction industrial construction and agricultural work are the occupations where worker are uh, more prone to corneal foreign body injury echo message corneal foreign body injuries can be prevented with proper precaution and, and preventive eyewear workers should be educated about the about such eye injuries and steps should be taken to initiate public awareness program on large scale this will help to uh, help in improving healthcare and reducing workers economic burden thank you very common to general of this next picture the bhavik panchal is there dr harsha kandoy dr monica polu good morning everyone myself dr monica currently doing my cornea fellowship in cornea refractive services in shankarai hospital guntur today we shall be discussing about a presentation of sterile infiltrate post refractive surgery before we dive into the case let's discuss few basics peripheral cornea is predisposed to inflammatory reactions due to its rich vascular and lymphatic supply to the limbus and also due to the presence of antigen presenting cells peripheral corneal infiltrates can occur due to different pathologies it includes presence because of staphylococcal toxins from the eyelids or ulcers associated with autoimmune or collagen vascular diseases so prk is a common surgical procedure for the treatment of mild to moderate refractive error its rare complications include infectious and sterile keratitis so the based on review of literature the pathogenesis of this entity remains unclear however few postulated theories are usage of topical nsaids or teofilm antigen hypothesis so what is this teofilm antigen hypothesis usually pooling of the teofilm occurs at heaped up epithelium and also under the bandage contact lens so at this area staphylococcal antigen deposition occurs which results in enhanced cell mediated immunity causing infiltrates the other theory was usage of nsaids NSAIDs inhibit cyclooxygenase pathway for the metabolism of arachidonic acid. This inhibition causes increased production of leukotrienes from the alternate pathway, which is mediated by lipooxygenase. So these chemoattractants result in deposition of inflammatory cells, causing infiltrate. So with this basic knowledge, let's discuss about our case. A 24-year-old male patient presented to our clinic with chief complaints of redness and watering in left eye since two days. there was no history of itching pain or diminution of vision and there was no history of ocular trauma or head injury he have undergone prk in both eyes 5 days ago for compound myopic astigmatism and he was using topical steroids and antibiotics post operatively on examination at 5 days post op his uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity was 66 and 6 in both eyes and on slit lamp examination right eye was normal with bcl in situ but in left eye there were dense lid crust on lid margin there was mild conjunctival congestion anterior chamber was quiet and we have noted a presence of arc shaped or half moon shaped creamy white infiltrate in the paralimbal area of approximately 4 into 2 mm 
um, with intervening clear zone between the cornea and the limb with the infiltrate and the limbus so rest of the findings were within normal limits so we made a diagnosis of both eyes status post prk with bcl in situ and we considered left eye differentials of infiltrate debris or scar so as it was present even after removing the bcl we have ruled out debris and as we can see the cellularity in the slit section we have ruled out scar so it is either infectious or sterile infiltrate so corneal scrapings and cultures along with the bcl were sent and we started the patient on fortified vancomycin and oflox d eye drops hourly we have explained the patient about importance of lid hygiene and also explained about lid scrubs we asked the patient to review after 5 days at 5 days infiltrate was noted resolving along with the scarring in left eye corneal scrapings and cultures were turned out to be negative but however as it was responding we have tapered oflox d and fortified vancomycin eye drops and we have continued the lubricants post operatively at 3 weeks we have noted complete resolution in left eye as shown in the picture so to discuss sterile corneal infiltrate is rare after refractive surgery the most likely cause of paralimbal sterile corneal infiltrates in this case was suspected to be antigens contained in the pole teophilum under the bandage contact lens so differentiating between infection and inflammation is difficult as infiltrates can occur with both the conditions uh, to conclude infiltrate after refractive surgery is a potentially vision threatening complication it highlights the need for a proper schedule of follow up sterile infiltrates with sudden onset can be successfully treated with aggressive steroid therapy to avoid significant corneal scarring treatment is usually successful with excellent prognosis these were my references and thank you excellent time management next speaker soumya vegnes so good morning to all the judges thank you for allowing me to present okay so i am dr bhavik panchar i'll be presenting about anti use of anti segment oc to diagnose occult scleral tear it's a novel non invasive technique so if you look at this what is common to all these three cases right so you have some kind of subconscious hemorrhage here you have post corneal limbal tear here and i with a uh, suspected scleral tear Right. So, can we predict which case will need an intervention in these cases? So, all these three cases are cases of occult scleral tear. Right. So, let's look at the case one. So, 65-year-old male, diminution of vision of one week duration, no history of trauma as such from the patient. But if you look at it closely, so B scan does show RD for this patient. Right. If you look at it closely, there is a kind of subconjunctival hemorrhage which is resolving. and there is one small dot noted here okay so we went ahead because of suspicion and did a ubm for this patient it shows that there was a scleral defect with query vitreous incarceration we went ahead with an anti segment oct to our surprise we saw that there was a full thickness defect in the sclera and you can actually see the vitreous which is getting incarcerated into this right so one of the sections clearly showing the vitreous are getting attached to the scleral tear again the conjecture had grown over this so there was no flap which was noted here coming to case number 2 so this patient post blast injury 2 days prior had presented with uh, high fema and a lot of anti segment inflammation okay if you look at all the segments here the superior segment a superior quadrant showed a conjunctival tear now being a child you have to give a ga to evaluate this child so we are looking at a non invasive technique through the conjunctival laceration if we have a tear or not to our so what we found that not just a conjunctival tear is present here there was a full thickness scleral tear which was noted as well and this child also had a foreign body because of the blast injury which was seen on the b scan coming to case number 3 this is post 
surgery for a limbal tear repair and because of our previous experience we went ahead with the anti segment OCT and to our surprise we had a uh, foreign body which was embedded underneath the sclera you can see the fantastic back shadowing post foreign body here a metallic foreign body so we have a total of six cases where there was good correlation between the anti segment OCT UBM and also the interoperative finding based on our uh, evidence what we noted we also correlated with the surgical notes which the surgeon had performed. So to conclude, ASOCTE is an important non-invasive diagnostic modality to diagnose occult scleral tears. It gave a confirmatory diagnosis of occult scleral tear which could have been easily missed, especially in the first case and the third case, the foreign body. It increases the predictive value in diagnosing occult scleral tear. Limitation, it cannot diagnose occult scleral tears which are posterior to the, uh, maybe beyond the insertion of the muscles. So, though surgical exploration remains the confirmatory diagnosis, ASOCT can be an important non-invasive diagnostic modality, especially in children, to confirm the diagnosis of an occult scleral tear. And uh, rate of surgical exploration can be reduced significantly by with such a simple non-invasive technique. Thank you so much. In first case, uh, yes. there is no history of injury. That is the patient gave the did not give any history of injury. Any other cause? So there was a history of injury, maybe the patient did not notice uh, that was because on finding out that we had a RDV CD that was on the B scan, we were trying to look out why the RDV CD had happened and we found this scleral tear along with the vitreous insulation. It was a long standing, uh, maybe a month old. In that case, uh, yes. you said uh, foreign body is there and uh, sclera is intact in that? No, it was underneath the sclera. So we, uh, we b based on the ASOCT. Underneath the sclera, we said it connected. Conjunctive was intact, it was underneath the sclera. So we just had to open up the sclera anteriorly and we found the foreign body sitting there. Right. Good. Yes, sure, sure. Open karna Open jelly. So this was not suspected the foreign body here. So it is not through the area of pigmentation. It was somewhere here that we found that this is the foreign body sitting right underneath the conjunctiva. And the sclera, so uh, I can tell you because I only operated this case. There was a thin layer. It can be a fibrous capsule also which was noted. But it was just anterior itself. Thank you so much for all the questions. Yes. Would you like to have to do any post uh, CD test third case? Uh, simple before before you go for an OCT and I mean uh, yes. OCT so a, a serial test will help us if there is any fluid which is coming out of it. No, no. no I'm talking about the post CD test. Correct. Post means occult uh, serial test, yeah. which were not being seen. So we Correct. can uh, it apply it pressure over. It may help us, but if it's already blocked by the vitreous, uh, the found vitreous, it, the fluid is not going to come out from that. It may not be always uh, a sensitive, 100% uh, sensitive. I agree. Yes. But, uh, it can, surely, it is also non invasive yes, test yes, we can yes, do. Yes. Surely, sir. Yes. Thank you so much.